if I were a betting man, which I'm not, I then I'd wager that there will definitely not be any official celebration in Germany this year to mark the says Crescentenary of the creation of the German Empire in 1871. This 150th anniversary is far more likely to be marked by a somber and reflective conference or symposium of distinguished historians who have long debated the continuity of German foreign policy from Bismarck to Hitler. I need hardly elaborate on the reasons why today's liberal, democratic, and outward-looking Bundesrepublik, committed to peaceful internationalism and at the very heart of the European Union, would feel uncomfortable about celebrating the Kaiserreich, whose last emperor played such a pivotal role in plunging Europe and the globe into the abyss of the World War, a world war in 1914. Oh, that was map. I'm supposed to be showing you that map. I apologize. Anyway, there's a map of um, Germany, the German Empire in 1871, and the Bundesrepublik today. That was the first slide you were. So I'll let you have a quick look at that. You'll see the borders are somewhat different these days. Um, to most people in the 21st century, it would seem baffling to put the adjective liberal before the noun nationalism. However, liberal nationalism was the ideological force unleashed upon Europe by the French Revolution, receiving its inspiration in the ideas of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. The term nationalism was first used in print in 1789 by the anti-Jacobin French priest, Augustin Baruel. Nationalism was a revolutionary creed reflecting the idea that subjects of the crown should become citizens of France. The Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen in 1789 proclaimed the principle of all sovereignty resides essentially in the nation. The French victories during the long wars did much to stimulate national feeling in the rest of Europe. This in turn led to the liberation of the Spanish and Portuguese colonies in South America and of the Ottoman territories in the Balkans, as well as the unification of both Italy and Germany. When Napoleon's Grand Armée was almost annihilated after the invasion of Russia in 1812, thousands of German burghers and students volunteered to fight in the wars of liberation the following year. Post-Napoleonic... I missed the paragraph. Apologize, my apologize for one moment, I think. Oh, I missed the part. Oh, yes. Uh, sorry. Um, after the successful Battle of Leipzig, they expected their efforts to be rewarded. They demanded a written constitution and German unification. Post Napoleonic Germany consisted of great powers such as Austria and Hungary and statelets like, such as Sachsen Weimar, uh, let me start this again, Sachsen Weimar Eisenach. It had been reduced from a much larger number of states to 39 states. Four of these were republics, while all the others were monarchies. The monarchies regarded liberals and nationalists as subversive elements. Written constitutions did not materialize, but secret police did. Their first char charge being to prevent revolution. 
the Holy Alliance initiated by Tsar Alexander I with the autocratic rulers of Austria and Prussia was determined to halt the progression of liberal nationalism after 1815, but neither the Tsar nor Metternich were able ultimately to stop it in its tracks. National consciousness was first engendered by the ideas of Johann Gottfried von Herder, his materials for the philosophy of the history of mankind was published in 1784. In it, Herder laid the intellectual foundations for the romantic concept of the nation and developed the theory of the Volksgeist as the spirit or soul of a national community. The book was highly influential and sparked off research into long neglected folklore and songs, including that of the Brothers Grimm. Um, can you all read that? Can you see it on your screens? Yes. Oh, oh, oh yeah, sorry, you should all be muted, but uh, if you, uh, <laughs> yes, please mute. Um, okay, um, I'll have a go at reading it if you can't. Uh, nature brings forth families. The most natural state thereof is also one people with a national character of its own. Nothing, therefore, seems more contradictory to the true end of government than the endless expansion of states, the wild confusion of races and nations under one scepter. An empire made up of a hundred peoples and a hundred and twenty provinces, which have been forced together, is a monstrosity, not a state body. Has a people anything dearer than the speech of its fathers? In its speech resides its whole thought domain, its tradition, history, religion, and basis of life, all its heart and soul. To deprive a people of its speech is to deprive it of its own one eternal good. No greater injury can be inflicted on a nation than to be robbed of her national character, the peculiarity of her spirit and her language. Reflect on this and you will perceive our irreparable loss. Look about you in Germany for the character of a nation, for their own particular cast of mind, for their own peculiar vein of speech. Where are they? If Germany were only guided by the forces of the age, by the leading strings of her own culture, our intellectual disposition would doubtless be poor and restricted, but it would be true to our own soil, fashioned upon our own model, and not so misshapen and cast down. At the Congress of Vienna, the map of Europe was redrawn. Old monarchies were restored also, and old sovereignties re-established. Balanced Europe meant one base on great powers rather than nation states. Those great powers were Britain, Russia, France, Austria, and Prussia. Nationalism came to refer to the political creed of those who sought the self-determination or independence of their countries from imperial sovereigns. Nationalists demanded the freedom of their peoples and therefore their nationalism was liberal. As the century progressed, the population of the 39 separate German states began to develop a sense in a sense, they were not just citizens of their own individual states, but part of a German folk people. They realized that they had much in common. Cultural nationalism was enhanced by the fact that all spoke the same language and shared similar customs. They had a common culture and shared a, the basic taste in, in literature and music. Writers like Hegel, Goethe and Schiller recognized the common, common German characteristics 
that contributed to the growing sense of Frederick of uh, German identity. Once upon a time, Voltaire had written to Frederick the Great, you, th you think like Trajan, you write like Pliny, you talk French with our best writers. Under your auspices, Berlin will be the Athens of Germany, perhaps of Europe. Nevertheless, the Prussia that was conquered by Napoleon was an enfeebled state that had almost ceased to exist, governed by an indecisive and weak monarch. It was no longer the great military power that had begun that had begun under Frederick, that it had become under Frederick the Great. Prussia was, however, the great beneficiary of the Congress of Vienna. Prussia was represented by its hardline chancellor, Prince von Hardenberg. The former kingdom of Poland had ceased to exist. Prussia was compensated for Russia's success in acquiring most of Poland. Prussia received substantial new territories in the West. The kingdom was greatly enlarged. The acquisition of the Rhineland was particularly significant for the future, as it became the heartland of its industry, which revitalized the Prussian economy. The Holy Roman Empire had been finally dissolved in 1806, after a thousand years. The Napoleonic Confederation of the Rhine had been also, was also dissolved. The German Confederation, Deutsche Bund, was created by the Congress of Vienna in 1815 to, order, order, to coordinate the economies of separate German-speaking countries and replace the former, um, former Holy Roman Empire. The new German Confederation consisted of 35 states and four free cities. The Austrian Chancellor Clements von Metternich was the architect of the Confederation and saw to it that Austria exercised a dominant influence. The sovereignty of each state was guaranteed, therefore. There was, therefore, there could be no development into a single nation state. Foreign members included Denmark, which held Einstein, sorry, sorry, held Holstein and Lauenburg, the latter being, having been ceded by Prussia in exchange for Pomerania. The British crown was linked to Hanover until 1837, and the Netherlands had possession of Luxembourg and Limburg. The Deutsche Bund sought to protect its members and give them a stronger voice in European affairs. It had a diet, parliament, which did little of any substance because its decisions had to be unanimous. It was a loose political association, lacking a central executive or judiciary. The Confederation Act of the 8th of June, 1815, was amended by the Vienna Final Act of the 15th of May, 1820, by which the German states were joined in the repression of liberal principles but the act gave the Confederation no additional powers. In 1818, Prussia, the largest and most powerful German state, apart from Austria, scrapped its trade barriers between its own territories. The following year, it offered an economic alliance at Zollverein with trade <coughs> concessions with, to other German states. In 1828, Prussia formed a customs union with Hesse Darmstadt. By 1836, 25 other German states had joined this economic alliance. Meanwhile, Prussia developed its road and railway networks to maximize trade opportunities. However, 
There are sep three separate and regional economic associations developed within the German states. Under the leadership of Prussia, these three merged on the 1st of 22nd of March, 1833, to form the German Customs Union, Deutsche Zollverein, which incidentally uh, was later a model for the formation of the European Economic Community. The treaty came into force on the 1st of January, 1834. The internal trap tariffs fell away, and the German economy was protected externally by a protective tariff. Dimensions, weights, and currencies were gradually standardized. Almost all German states ultimately joined the Zollverein. The German Customs Union had to be renewed in 1841 for a term ending the 31st of December, 1853. The German Customs Union enabled the free movement of goods and promoted economic development. The mining, mechanical, engineering, and iron industries flourished. As in other countries in Europe, Germany suffered from what historians have termed the, the hungry forties. Agrarian society still continued to be in an almost feudal way with the distinction between landlords and peasants. And most states were states were still governed by autocratic monarchs. Throughout the 1840s, many German states were under pressure from nationalist and liberal demonstrators wanting to greater political repression and reform. They believed that unifying Germany with popular elections and a constitution would also be the most likely option of guaranteeing political freedoms and civil rights. However, their monarchs feared the diminution, diminution of their powers and viewed the demands of the nationalists with foreboding. These issues came to a head when in Germany, as in elsewhere, elsewhere in Europe, revolutions broke out in 18. 48. Despite being a staunch opponent of popular democracy and written constitutions, the King of Prussia was forced in 1848 to draft a Prussian constitution and allow elected parliament to meet and advise him. He agreed to this after witnessing civil unrest on the streets of Prussia's capital, Berlin. After widespread revolts, not only across the 39 states, but also across many European nations, such as France, a parliament was called to discuss reforms and attempt to draft a constitution for a unified Germany. This was seen as being the best way of stopping political unrest. Liberals and nationalists gathered in Frankfurt and attempted to create a single German nation state. They were faced with two options. The first was a Kleindeutsch or little German uh, solution with the unity of the Northern German states under a Pr Prussian monarch. The second was a Großdeutsch or big German solution, which would include Austria. These offered two very different scenarios. The first would mean the dominance of Protestant Prussia, while the latter would mean that Austria with its older and more prestigious Habsburg monarchy, monarchy, monarchy would be dominant. In general terms, Germany was divided between the Protestant North and the Catholic South. Religious affiliation still mattered and had political consequences. The constitution was completed in March 1849. This would unite the German states as a German empire headed by a German emperor. Government would be provided by an elected parliament that represented the population of all 39 states the new German Empire would replace the existing Bund, 
the crown was offered to Pr Prussia's Frederick William IV. The Frankfurt Parliament in the attempt to unify Germany through political reform failed. Frederick William refused to accept the crown because it had not been offered by the other German princes, stating that he would not accept a crown from the gutter. By late 1849, the movement for political reform had lost its impetus, and the German princes and the Austrian emperor were able to regain control of politics in their territories. After the failure of the Frankfurt Parliament, Prussia put forward a plan to unite the German states under Prussian control. They believe, sorry, my fault, wrong line. The question was then posed as to whether a united Germany would contain Austria, Gross Deutschland, or leave it out, Klein Deutschland. The Prussians, as rivals of the Austrians, argued for Austria's exclusion. The Austrians refused to agree with the Prussian plan since it would eliminate their influence in German affairs. The Austrians persuaded the Bund's federal diet to threaten sanctions against Prussia. In 1850, with Russia's support, support for supporting Austria, the Prussians backed down. Another attempt at a unified Germany would fail. And now the figure who is going to uh, dominate almost the rest of this, all the rest of this talk. Otto Eduard Leopold Fürst von Bismarck Schönhausen, Herzog von Lauenberg zu Lauenberg, 1815 to 1898, was the son of a Prussian aristocratic Junker and an upper middle class mother. According to A.J.P. Taylor, Bismarck was, was always shaped by Junker interests. He was among those conservatives who had bitterly opposed the revolutions of 1848. But he was also the one man who did most to bring about the unification of Germany. Bismarck came to recognize that the tide of liberalism could not be just held back forever. Therefore, it had to be managed and manipulated. He wanted a unified Germany absorbed into a conservative Prussia, rather than have Prussia absorbed into a liberal Germany. His policy was to be dictated by Realpolitik, which decreed that policies had to be based on their practicality. Bismarck proved from an early stage to be a brilliant diplomat. He served as a Prussian representative to the, in the German Diet from 1851 to 18, until 1858, staunchly upholding the interests of his beloved Prussia and his fellow Junkers. It was there that that he made his name as an opponent of Austria. He was then, he went, he then went to St. Petersburg as an ambassador and then was appointed to Paris. 1858 to 1862 were his years, as he put it, in cold storage. Otto von Bismarck first met Benjamin Disraeli who was then leader of the opposition of the Commons at the Russian ambassador's residence in London in the summer of 1862. By the way, they always had a mutual respect right to the end, the, the two of them. On this occasion, Bismarck, on the verge of assuming power, audaciously opened, uh, and openly outlined his master plan to, to him. I shall soon be compelled to undertake the conduct of Prussian government. My first care will be to reorganize the army, with or without the help of the Landtag, the legislature. As soon as the army shall have been brought into such a coalition, 
against Austria, dissolve the German Diet, subdue the minor states, and give national unity to Germany under Prussian leadership. I have come here to say this to the Queen's ministers. Bismarck wanted to build up the Prussian, Prussia's army in case his unification plans led to war. To do this, he needed money. The Prussian Landtag refused, so he ignored it and simply collected the money through general taxation. Bismarck then fulfilled his ambition to give national unity to Germany under Prussian unit leadership through a series of lightning wars of unification. As the new minister president of Prussia, Bismarck vowed to achieve this by blood and iron. To achieve by blood and iron what the liberals failed to do by parliamentary means in Frankfurt. Viscount Palmerston made the following remark about the Schleswig Holstein case. It was, of course, his um, little um, battle with Bismarck over this issue, which proved to be Palmerston's undoing ultimately in foreign affairs. The Schleswig Holstein question is so complicated. Only three men in Europe have ever understood it. One was Prince Albert, who is dead. The second was a German professor who became mad. I am the third, and I've forgotten about it. The issue was indeed a complicated one. These two small and sparsely populated duchies lay between Denmark and Prussia. They had been ruled since 1460 by the kings of Denmark as their dukes. Holstein was half German speaking and inside the Confederation since 1815. Schleswig was half Danish and half German speaking. The Germans believed that the claim of the Danish king depended on the male line. Months before his death, the Danish king Frederick VII proclaimed that the monarchy was one and indivisible and its sovereignty, uh, uh, as was its sovereignty over the duchies. When he died in November 1863, the male line became extinct. He was succeeded by Christian IX, whose claim was through the female line. Bismarck recognized the rival claimant whose descent was through the male line. He proposed an alliance with Austria to seize the duchies. After a quick and successful war, the administration of Schleswig was placed under Prussia and that of Holstein under Austria. After victory in the next war against Austria, which I'm coming to, in 1866, they, were, they both became part of Germany and remained so until 1920. Ah. Out of order. Sorry, I'll go back. It had been Bismarck's aim to find a pretext, a pretext for war with Austria in order to win over control of the whole of Schleswig Holstein. In June 1866, Prussian troops invaded Holstein. The German states were divided in their support for Prussia and Austria. Most of the Catholic southern states supported Austria. The Prussian army under von Polka advanced into Bohemia and defeated the Austrians decisively at the Battle of Königgrätz on the 3rd of July. The next day, Prussian troops were outside Vienna, having occupied Hesse, Saxony and Hanover. King William I and his ministers were in favor of taking Vienna. But Bismarck had, um, had, um, but Bismarck had the, um, had the victory he wanted and, and desired a peaceful settlement with Austria that would ultimately bring Austria into an amicable relationship with Prussia. Austria 
agreed to the dissolution. Uh, sorry. The dissolution of the German Confederation and the foundation of the North German Confederation. Peace was signed with the Southern South, South Southern States. Prussia and with Prussia, with the Southern States, Prussia, and next with Hanover, Hesse Kassel, Kassel, Nassau, Han um, Frankfurt and Schleswig-Holstein. It was a victory for the Klein-Deutsch solution. The power relationship in Northern, Northern Europe shifted decisively in Prussia's favor. With a growing concern of Imperial France, who vainly demanded territorial compensation. So. The Seven Weeks War did not so much unite Germany as divided it into three. The area north of the river mine came under Prussian domination, while the full, the, the, the southern states continued with a precarious independence. And Austria was divided forever from Germany, except under, the, under Hitler's Anschluss. Austria, the loser in both Italian unification and in the Großdeutsch cause, now turned its attention to expansion and influence in southeastern Europe and the Balkans, with potential gains from the weakening Ottoman Empire. The Habsburgs submitted to sharing power with non-Germans, resulting in the Ausgleich of 1867, which created the dual monarchy of Austria-Hungary. So up to that point, one talks about Austria or the Austrian Empire beyond 1867 until 1918, of course, uh, it's Austria-Hungary. Austria A North German Confederation was set up. The constitution of the Confederation was largely the endorsement of Bismarck's ideas. One British historian put it succinctly, it was designed for the express purpose of preserving Prussian predominance in Germany. It formed the blueprint for the constitution of the German Empire. The King of Prussia became president of the Confederation and commander in chief of the Confederate Army. The Bundestag or Parliament was established for the states in this North German Confederation. The King of Holland wanted to sell his sovereign rights over Luxembourg in March 1867. France wished to acquire Luxembourg as a stepping stone um, to gaining Belgium, although she had been a signatory to the Treaty of London, which guaranteed Belgium's independence and perpetual neutrality. In the immediate aftermath of the Austro, this is a rather later photograph of Bismarck here, of course. In the immediate aftermath of the Austro-Prussian War, Bismarck wanted to avoid war by using negotiation. The chance of success is not a, not a just cause for beginning a great war. He obtained a conference in London in May 1867, whereby the King of Holland kept the Grand Duchy. The crisis passed over without war, but Napoleon III had been, was left humiliated and disillusioned with Bismarck. Bismarck found his, his excuse for war with Spain when, when offered the vacant crown, or uh, his vacant crown to a, when, no, sorry, Bismarck found his excuse for war when Spain offered its vacant crown to a relative for the Prussian King William the, Wilhelm I. Napoleon III was infuriated and the French insisted that King Wilhelm make his relative refuse the crown. Wilhelm refused to guarantee this. Bismarck used the King's refusal as a way to provoke the French. He published a heavily edited and provocative 
telegram, known as the Ems telegram, of the king's refusal, making it seem he had insulted the French ambassador. The French emperor, responding in fury from the French press and public, declared war on Prussia. Bismarck aimed to use this war as a way to gain control of the southern states, which could not stay neutral in the event of war. In the Franco-Prussian War, France was heavily defeated and speedily, and Paris suffered from a terrible siege which reduced his population to starvation. Napoleon III was overthrown by a rebellion in Paris and went into exile in England. As a result of the Franco-Prussian War, uh, remind me, I can tell you a family story about that exile if you want it afterwards. As a result of the Franco-Prussian War, France lost its territory of Alsace-Lorraine on the border with Germany. It also had to pay Germany uh, 200 million pounds in compensation, although their indemnity was not Bismarck's idea. The northeast of France was occupied until the indemnity was fully paid in 1873. The Southern Confederate States voluntarily joined the Prussian controlled North German Confederation. The new German imperial constitution was set up within the now unified German states with Wilhelm, with Wilhelm I as Emperor of Kaiser and the Prussia firmly in control. The German Empire was proclaimed in the Hall of Mirrors and the Treaty of Paris of Versailles on January the 18th, 1871, thereby rubbing salt into France's humiliated wounds. The historian William Carr called the German Empire an uneasy compromise between the forces of conservative federalism, liberal unitary principle, and the military might of Prussia. Sovereignty resided in the 22 rulers and not in the electorate. These states were represented by the Bundesrat, which had more power than the Reichstag. The Bundesrat represented the federal aspects of the empires, kings, princes, and federal free states. Responsible to the imperial government and not to the Reichstag, its meetings were held in private and presided over by the chancellor. His consent was needed to levy new taxes and not to continue, but not to continue existing ones. He vetoed constitutional changes. The Reich's chancellor, chancellor was responsible for the administration of the empire and accountable to the emperor personally, who appointed him and dismissed him. He was not responsible to act according to the Reichstag's resolutions. The constitution vested enormous executive powers in the chancellor, but in practice, that power had its basis in the minister presidency of Prussia. When Bismarck relinquished this briefly in 1873, he took it up quickly again when uh, he took it up quickly again when he realized its importance as his real power base. The Chancellor presided over the Bundesrat and the administrative offices of the Empire. However, all ministers were appointed and dismissed by the Emperor personally. In the German Empire, power resided. Wilhelm II, whom we're not dealing with tonight, characteristically once said, there is only one master in this country, I am that, who opposes me, I shall crush to pieces. Of the eight chancellors 
only two fell from power through extra parliamentary conflict and intrigue, while the last lost office when the monarchy ended in 1918. The other five were dismissed by the emperor, but only after defeat in the Reichstag. The Reichstag itself had little real power, but was a concession to the principle of mass democracy and symbolized the unity of the empire. The Kaiser alone had the right to adjourn it or adjourn or to close the Reichstag. However, dissolution also required the agreement of the Bundesrat. Bills were normally initiated by the Chancellor in the Bundesrat and passed uh, the upper chamber, if you like, and passed through its committees and then down to the Reichstag merely for consent. In 1926, one German parliamentarian recalled in the speech to the, in the Reichstag, the old Reichstag was a useless parliament. It could only speak, but it had no real power. The communist leader Karl Liebknecht famously described the old Reichstag, Reichstag as the fig leaf covering the nakedness of capitalism. There were two conservative parties, two liberal parties, and one Catholic party in the Reichstag. The older Prussian Conservative Party had agrarian, Juncker, and Albion support. It, it was opposed, it opposed Bismarck's pro, um, policy of unification and felt threatened by industrialization. He controlled the Prussian Landtag, but expanded into the German uh, Conservative Party in 1874. 76. The Free Conservatives were also a Prussian party founded in 1866. Their support came from the commercial, industrial, and professional interests, and they generally supported Bismarck. After the uni unification, they became the Deutsche Reichspartei. Both liberal parties were also originally Prussian and began th through a split in the old Prussian Liberal Party in 1867. The National Liberals were the main pillar of Bismarck's policy until 1878, when the free trader minority split from the protectionist majority to form the Liberal Union. The Progressive Party also originated in 1867 and was opposed to Bismarck's despotic nationalism, as they saw it. It refused to sacrifice liberal principles to liberal it and took German interests, particularly especially personal freedom and limited government. In 1884, the Liberal Union and the Progressive Party merged to form the Free Thinking Party. The merger of socialist parties in 1875 created the Socialist Workers Party of Germany with trade union connections. Under Bismarck's anti-socialist law of 1878, which I'll come to in shortly, the party was proscribed, but it was refounded in 1890 as the Social Democratic Party, the SPD. Remaining faithful to the principles of parliamentary constitutionalism, in the achievement of democratic socialism. The centre party was Roman Catholic, but formed as a national party in 1870 by Windhorst, Ludwig Windhorst, Ludwig Windhorst, sorry. It was interdenominational in its programme, but predominantly Roman Catholic in its support, especially in the Catholic Southern states. It had no clearly defined ideological position. We're coming towards the end. Bismarck callously adopted a policy of divide and rule during his period in power, which lasted until 1890. In 1864, Pope Pius IX published 
a wide ranging and reactionary collection of 80 anathemas in the syllabus of errors, in which he also condemned all interference by the civil powers in the authority of the church over those spheres which he considered to be within their its God-given domain, and also all modern trends towards progress. This was followed in 1870 by the promulgation of the dogma of papal infallibility at the First Vatican Council. Bismarck was a staunch Protestant and a firm believer in the authority of national governments. He launched his Kulchkampf, culture struggle, against the interference of the Roman Catholic Church in what he regarded to be within the lawful jurisdiction of the civil power, especially in relation to national education. Between 1871 and 1878, he depended on his alliance with the National Liberals, the largest party in the Reichstag. Therefore, he followed a liberal free trade policy and sided with the rising tide of anti-clericalism in Europe, especially in France. The Roman Catholic Church became a useful scapegoat. Bismarck sought to exclude the Roman Catholics of southern Germany, especially Bavaria, from political influence and power because of their opposition to the centralization of power in Berlin. His main target was the Catholic Center Party, party which were branded as Reichsfinder, enemies of the Reich. The Great Depression began in 1873, and it included many European countries towards protect, uh, and it inclined many European countries towards protectionism, and both industri just industrialists and Junkers demanded it. The army to be strengthened also, by, also required protection. Bismarck sought a realignment with the right wing of the National Liberals and an alliance with the Centre Party, now suddenly in favour, um, whom he had attacked previously. The new scapegoat were the Socialists and the Social Democrats. The 1879 Tariff Act imposed duties on steel, iron and grain. This policy of protection that was continued until 1890 was known as Sammlungspolitik. In 1878, Bismarck pushed through the anti-socialist law, banning the large and political Social Democratic Party from political participation, as well as other socialist and communist societies and assemblies, and the publishing of their pamphlets. The socialists now replaced the Catholics as the primary enemy of the Reich. The anti-socialist campaign brought about a, re a rapprochement between the Prussian Lutherans and the Bavarian Catholics. Bismarck also engineered a new coalition with the National Liberals, which represented the industrial West and conservatives and Catholics in the East and South, which represented the more agrarian and traditional side of Germany. The two. This, so the, um, Industrialists um, referred to as rye, um, iron and the agricultural as rye. This was so, the so called marriage of iron and rye and paved the way to even more conservative authoritative in politics, industrial protection, and a further, a further weakening of the already marginalized Reichstag. Kaiser Wilhelm II. Kaiser Wilhelm I, sorry, died in 1887 at the age of 91. His son, the Grand Crown Prince Frederick, was married to Queen Victoria's eldest daughter, Vicky. He acceded to the throne as Frederick III. Liberal hopes had been on his ascent to the throne, but he was dying of cancer and his reign lasted a mere 100 days. Their son, the young, impetuous, and unpredictable Wilhelm II acceded to the throne. Although he had been schooled in politics by Bismarck, they soon fell out over Bismarck's social conservatism 
and violently quarreled over the 1890 election. Bismarck was forced to resign on the 18th of March, 1890. It was the end of an era in Germany, of German, and all, uh, in German and indeed European politics. Thank you very much.